Game loaded. Podcast and my friend here, Chapman.、Uh, closing of the year, we're going to be talking about indie games and the double A industry, and whatever news we can pick up along the way. So, if you're new to the program,、uh, you're more than welcome. So, hi, say hi, Chapman. Evening, everybody. <laughs> Evening or night or morning, wherever you are.、Um, If you, for some reason, miss、uh, the show here, you can always pick it up、uh, on the Lessons Learned YouTube channel as well as the VODs here. So let us begin. Well, we'll get we'll get the old horse that we keep beating up this year or the last quarter this year out of the way with another story about EA and Battlefront. It seems now that EA or EA Dice used to be just Dice. Uh, has adjusted the XP awards、uh, to get in-game rewards after they removed, or in the words of Electronic Arts, suspended the microtransactions. Ah,、uh, boy.、That's... So, the, so I think this sends a clear message to anyone who says that microtransactions don't affect the gameplay of any game. I think this kind of contradicts that. It really does. I mean, well, in case of Battlefront, the Battlefront was done around the microtransaction. Nobody can say otherwise, right? The grind, the this, the that. It was designed so that people would, in fact, pay money for the loot crates and the cards and the things, so that it would go better, right? But it's always been affecting the, the microtransactions, right? It, it's Even the gen- even the cosmetic stuff, like oh, it doesn't affect、oh. the game, you know. Well, <laughs> cat alert, <laughs> <laughs> kitty alert.、Um, it always does because you want to show off your cosmetics, right? Especially games that have like a social aspect, it's like online. It's like, yeah, you want to show those the cape, the shoulders, the sprays, the voice lines, all of that. It affects how you experience the game. So, yeah, otherwise it wouldn't be important. People wouldn't buy it, right? Yeah. So, even in single player games, like getting a new costume for your character, like oh, I got this new costume for my character. Hey, that's fun, you know. Um, so you do it, and and putting that behind a paywall, of course,、uh, affects everything. Um, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, the the big question still remains: Is this EA just simply temporarily backtracking? Is this going to be permanent? They're putting microtransactions this type in every game they can come across. You know they've done it before, and the high-profile case is Star Wars, but they put it in other games as well. It was a fighting game, I think.、Um, uh, UFC also had a similar、oh, system as yeah. well. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's like, I guess they're not stopping as long as you know they'll change if they get caught and everybody makes a stink about it. But they're not. They're going to try to get. You know they're doubling down on this stuff as much as possible, which、yeah. le- leads to me the question of whether or not Disney will simply just pull the plug. And right now, I doubt it. Yeah, it's gonna have to get pretty egregious for、yeah. for Disney to step in. I think what's gonna happen is if EA tries to release more products along the lines, of, you know, concomitantly or with. Disney Star Wars、uh, products, as, you know, movies specifically, and this keeps happening, then that's when Disney's gonna go. Okay, enough, you know, because we're talking about billions of dollars here. You know, this these are, you know, the contracts are for for millions of dollars. The possible earnings on both sides are in the billions. When that happens, lawyers show up, <laughs> and when lawyers show up. Everybody gets feisty. Yeah, so I think it's going to be a matter of.、Um, I'm actually curious now if they'll at least tone it down a little when it comes to Star Wars,、hmm. J- just to say on、uh, Disney's good side and just to play it safe. But I-, I don't think it's going to affect any of their other products. Not unless people keep the pressure up. And yeah, I- and I doubt it because I think. Like we talked about last week, it was a strange confl- confluence of a big name brand beyond video games, the fans, and the expectations they're in. Exactly. Yeah,、uh, 
and that doesn't happen in every other game, right? There's yeah. A lot of, there's a lot of games that make a lot of money for EA, and they're not really high profile, especially their sports games. So I don't see yeah, it. Yeah, which is odd. You, just, you wouldn't, you don't see like the NFL stepping in saying like, "Oh, you, these microtransactions are giving NFL a bad name because the players are not racing a sink, right?" Yeah, and it's weird. I mean, talk about NFL games and and FIFA and all that. They're some of the biggest franchises out there, and well, they're video games, but within the what I call the gamer sphere, right? Yeah. They're not that big. No. So it's big for EA. It's big for the NFL, FIFA, and all that, of course. And makes, I think it was like, I think it was FIFA alone made $800 million for EA a year. If you calculate that for every game they have, they have a basketball game, a football game, a, you know, soccer game. They work at what? 1.6 to 2.4 or more billion dollars a year? Just in those games, and probably six or seven billion, right? Yeah, um, collectively, uh, they, if, if all the games are making the kind of same kind of money, probably not. Probably FIFA is the biggest, and then NFL others make a couple hundred million as well. But you know, it does add up. I mean, two hundred million more, and you're over a billion dollars a year, which is which is good in anybody's books. Um, but um, I mean. If if they if they're willing to put up with it, ironically the the people who play those games are I we would consider to be casual gamers. Yeah. yeah, they're or they're only hardcore in a sense that they'll be specifically hardcore towards those genres. Mm -hmm. They're they don't kind of step out of those sports genres. And in fact, um, my mother's boyfriend, that's all he ever plays is a uh, NFL. NASCAR games, it's also an EA game, and I believe he might play a couple shooter games like Rainbow Six or probably like the latest Call of Duty game. Mm -hmm. So I'm, not, I'm actually kind of curious now to maybe like next time I visit, just kind of observe like his gaming habits and just kind of see if any of these microtransactions are having an impact on him as just a player. Does he care? Does he not? Yeah, I mean, I, again, we discussed this last week in the sense of. It's more of an playing those games an extension of a different fandom, right? Uh, yeah. You're an NFL fan, so you get all the things that are NFL related, including the video game. You're a football fan, ergo you get the video game because it's part of being a football fan, right? You play your team and stuff like that. You know, you're a soccer fan, you know, international football, FIFA, right? They're big because those games are huge, and people who like that. You know, just like buying a jersey or going to the you know, go going to the park to watch a the 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 game. This is part of that. So yeah. it's not their main focus. Where with Star Wars, although Star Wars is part of a much bigger franchise, the people who play Star Wars games are first and foremost players of of, of all games. Mm -hmm. They're quote unquote gamers who like Star Wars. They're gamers first, in you know in their in their you know in their buying habits, and Star Wars fans second. They bought it because it's it's a great game that they want to play an F, an FPS game, first person third person shooter, which also happens to be Star Wars, right? Yeah. So that's what it is. So yeah, we uh, we hopefully this will be for the end of the year the last piece of news. What has to do Battlefront? Well probably hear something in 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 next um in the at the uh, i think it's the end of the fiscal year or the beginning of the fiscal year first quarter of the fiscal year which is about and it's about march that's when we probably hear some real news about whether or not battlefront really suffered yeah or yeah. see if they're going to keep the microtransactions around are they going to wait until the hype for the movie is over and it's out of theaters mm -hmm. Because, um, well, this is basically a tie-in product, more or less. By its own emission, by its own business model, the idea is to keep this game going as long as possible, right? To keep yeah. people playing Battlefront well beyond, you know, the lifetime of the movie, which is, what, a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two at most, right? Yeah. 
So again, you know, it, this is this very strange influ confluence of fandoms and uh, IP, and I think that's what makes it kind of unique. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see if that has an impact. But there's another side, or more than one side, to the video game industry. And we have in that side, as the title of this podcast suggests, indies and the so-called double A industry. Now, we talked about the double A industry before, but we never really dug into it. And I think it's we should start with defining what the double A industry is by today's standards. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they particularly call themselves that, though. I think that's just a name we've kind of given them because we don't really have a, another name for them. They're just like a mid-tier market between mm -hmm. the the indies and the triple A productions, triple A in parentheses. Yeah, well, I would define, well, there's two ways of looking. I would say that double A industry is, again, that middle market. Usually they sell products in anywhere between 20 to $60, right? Yeah. Um, so price range is there. Also, they are very much uh, developers who are more or less independent and either self-publish, most likely in these two, or they sign a one-off uh, publishing deal. Yeah. Right. And, but there's another way of looking at that, and that is, even when you talk about EA Activision, it's the way many of these studios started, right? It used, it's, it was a very common and not exclusive way of doing business after, particularly after the crash of 1983 in the United States, right? Because before, yeah. you know, with Atari, with Intellivision, ColecoVision, et cetera, what would tend to happen, not always, but would tend to happen, especially Atari, all games were supposed to be first party games. In fact, Atari went to uh, went got uh, lost a lawsuit because they wanted to stop other companies from selling their own games for their platform under their own on their own you know name, right? As opposed yeah. to under the Atari name. Like, if you wanted to make a game like Star Wars, for example, if um, I played this game. This game actually came out for Park. It was Parker Brothers who made the Empire Strikes Back game. Star Wars. Star Wars has been with video games for a very long time. For Atari. Now, the way it used to work was that if, you know, George Lucas, LucasArts wanted to make a game for Atari, they would have to talk to Atari. Atari would make the official Star Wars game with the Atari logo on it. It would be yeah. in-house. So they would get almost all the revenue. After that, in consoles, you started having licenses, which, you know, stuff like other consoles, I mentioned Nintendo and Sega, would do, third-party developers. And third-party developers, of course, existed on PC and home computers from the very beginning because those manufacturers didn't make games. They didn't have in-house game development. They just made the machines, and people made software for the machines. Uh, so they even, for example, many of the home computers bought... People don't know this. Their operating systems and was tended to be a version of Basic from Microsoft, even though the version of Basic wasn't compatible across, across other machines. It came from the same, you know, pub, developer publisher, which was Microsoft. When Activision came in, Activision came in as a from people from Atari, and they wanted to develop their own games, and one of them was Pitfall. Electronic Arts was one of the first sort of, not only, but one of the first umbrella publishers. Although they started with the idea that they were going to publish other people's products, right? Yeah. But they were going to be high integrity and they were going to be, you know, as it's, a, it, it's supposed to be uh, interactive art that was supposed to be better than uh, just sitting in front of a television passively. Yeah. yeah. Hence the arts in electronic arts. Yep. That's kind of ironic bad, now. Yeah. <laughs> and it hasn't been for a while. Uh, but many a game designer, especially the sort of uh, indies that we like to call them today, back then they were called garage coders or bedroom coders, right? Uh, programmers. It always been an indie scene. But as games get more complicated, you needed more people to make them. So 
you always had a sort of this mid tier, right? Not so much in price range, but a certain level of independence. And it up to the 2000s, you know, we tend to flog a lot on, we, we were talking before the, the program, we talked about uh, Mass Effect Andromeda, well, Bioware was one of those, right? Yeah. Um, and many of the games, in fact, they subcontracted. Valve, if you look at the, 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 uh, the box for Half-Life, the original Half-Life, it was Sierra Online who uh, published that game. Now, of course, Valve is, well, not even a publisher. It's a huge <laughs> seller of games through Steam, right? Yeah, like a marketplace, I guess. A marketplace. It is what it is. GOG uh, came also marketplace for uh, uh, CD Projekt Red. Red. But they're still a publisher slash self-published. Well, they self-publish, I think, in the in, in Europe, but they do make publishing deals in the states i don't i think it was with uh electronic arts that they i have to check uh they publish um you know um witcher 3 hmm. no yeah who did they publish under I no 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 warner up. brothers warner brothers oh. it was warner brothers no it wasn't it wasn't um it's uh, just as bad <laughs> well yeah but but the thing is and and the game i've been playing which is kingdoms of amalore Technically, it belongs to Electronic Arts, but it was done by big, big eight that's, games. That's, uh, I think. And 30, 38 Studio. 38 Studios uh, under a publishing deal, but 38 Studios was not and doesn't exist anymore, but at no point was it owned by uh, Electronic Arts. I think over time, and we saw it again, Electronic Arts comes back into the forefront because they're the ones who really started this process of sort of buying off studios. I remember Origins back in the day was a big studio in the in the eighties and nineties. You, you don't know what Origins or Origin, sorry, is. I don't know why I put an S on it. Um, it was uh, from the developers of Ultima, the Ultima series, Wing Commander, a obscure game that I love, but would love to have a, a, a remake of Space Rogue, but of course the rights are owned by EA, so we'll never see it. There are others such as Micropose who made their own, a lot of games, so they started also publishing other people's names, uh, games like the original XCOM wasn't developed by Micropose, it was developed in the UK, Micropose being a, an American company, Cinemaware, etc. I mean, there were a lot of developers, but I think the price of making games kept growing and also just it's it was harder i mean and i think that's what we're going to discuss it's, it's it's very easy to, to romanticize the sort of independent developer but well there's a lot of problems with it and, uh, yeah like mostly in terms of funding <laughs> Especially if it's just you in a small studio. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm just kind of curious now. Like, how much did... Oh. I was kind of curious. Like, one game that comes to mind was, like, Undertale. Like, a lot of uh, small-time uh, indies nowadays just turn to Kickstarter and see, like, essentially pitch an idea to an audience and say, hey, would you like this game made? Mm -hmm. If so, this is how much I would like. Please back my project. Oh, wow, Undertale only got like fifty thousand. Yeah, for and such an amazing game. <laughs> but it is a retro game. I mean, the style of it is very yeah. much NES, you know, early and, NES stuff like that. And I'm kind of wondering if uh, if that has something to do with the cost too. If like, is the cost of making games going up because of the technology, and does the price like never, in terms of working with said technology, is that never coming down, or at least not as quickly as it should well it depends i think the the, the videos i've seen the studios i the, the studies i've seen is that in fact the cost of making games has stabilized what is really the cost is the cost of publishing it right i mean making a triple a style game is expensive you know it's a tens of millions maybe hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for example the two big examples i always give are gta 5 and the original Destiny. Between them, there were over three quarters of a billion dollars. But a lot of that money goes into, you know, advertising, getting eyeballs on target, right? 
making this game look and feel like it's the big game, right? That you have to buy. One of the problems, for example, for indies in places like Steam is that there's just just too much out there. It's 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 like the Apple Store. It's like you know going to you know uh, a mobile device. There's so many games out there. There's so much products out there. Then getting yourself noticed is now impossible, unless you become sort of a you know a critic darling or a gamer darling, right? Like Undertale, like yeah. Stardew Valley, uh, and stuff like that, right? So I think most of the publishing is not it's not simply covering the cost of making the game. It's also covering the cost of, you know, publishing or putting it out there, right? And if you spend fifty million dollars making a game, but didn't spend another fifty million advertising it, then you might as well have wasted the fifty million, right? Yeah. We also see another problem with, you know, indies most, especially with crowdsourced stuff, is that. There's a lack of discipline. Let's be honest. You know, uh, what's, yeah. the, what's the game that is coming out that it's a uh, space game has, hasn't come out. It's been coming out for a very long time. It's gotten a lot of money. Um, uh, F- FTL? No, 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 FTL, no, no, FTL. No, FTL was a success. Uh, I'm talking about it's... Oh, boy. Um, from the guys who made Wind Commander. Um, ooh. Hmm. Now I blanked out on the name. Oh, boy. Um, uh, it's just like a spiritual successor to Wing Commander. Yeah, yeah. Um, just tech. Um, Chris Roberts, who made the 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 game. Let me. Um, Chris Roberts. Um, uh, game developer, Star Citizen. Ah. Uh. Well, Chris Roberts has been somebody who's always had just one of the sort of millennial type big idea type guys, right? Uh, but. It's, it seems that he has uh, the unfortunate um, problem, at least with seems Wing Commander, some people defend Wing Commander, uh, not Wing Commander, but Chris, uh, Chris Roberts and Star Citizen, in that you don't, you know, you don't get the, the business savvy to go with, um, with the art- artistry, right? You don't get the management ability to manage a game alongside developing the game and we've seen this many times before we saw it with mmos we saw it with um you know um daikatana was an infamous case uh romero was going to make um this next you know doom like game and he produced one game that was good and one game that was bad. <laughs> and that game that was bad was Daikatana, right? That mm. everybody hated, right? A lot of wasted money there. And of course, who uh, could who could forget a, <laughs> a, a what you would call it? Oh, no, I, for, no, I forgot. No, my it. No, well, there's that one. But though they weren't, yeah, they started off as indie and then they got backed by Sony, didn't they? No, Sony had a publishing deal with them. Oh. So technically they were still double A, but yeah, they they made a lot of promises that they simply couldn't keep, at least not at first. Um oh, I, I was thinking of Mighty Number no. Nine. I was gonna call it by its a uh, mocking name. <laughs> no, Mighty Number no. Nine is another example, right? Big people with big ideas, like Peter Molyneux, you know, the Molyneux effect, people with big ideas, but when you give them money, they don't know what to do with it, you know. And sometimes you do need the business types to come in and like, no, you need to hit this target and do this thing. And you got to, you know, you, you need someone to come in and be able to, as I say in the writing world, kill the darlings, right? Yeah. Because there's a tons of ideas that, oh, this is a great idea and stuff like that. But if you can put a, a, a coherent product together. Also, a lot of Kickstarters just like uh, early access in in Steam, never make it out, either because they're not successful enough because they said, oh, nobody's interested or they lowball the number or they're too successful too early. Yeah. Too much money. And so it's like we made our money and so there's no actual reason to release a a complete game because the thing about the double A is they're also doing things the old-fashioned way in a sense of, we make a game and we sell it to you and that's it. 
Yeah. With all the risks that that involves, right? It's like, well, the game didn't sell, so that means we don't have money for the next game, right? If we get in outside investors, they start getting control because whoever cuts the checks makes the rules. So there's that. Or, or at least with, uh, of course, some Kickstarters, you just never get a product. There's actually a Kickstarter I had in mind that I'm like, hey, I wonder what happened to that because I remember it being successful and I gave it like $35 like years and years ago. And then it, I just noticed like, hey, there, have, there hasn't been an update for years and years and years. Yeah. So as far as I know, they ran off with the money. Oh, yeah. There have been cases of people, I think it was Early Access or another indie game, uh, crowdfunding game, where they said, oh, yeah, they spend it on hookers and blow, basically. Yep. It was like, oh, man. But I think the secret, and we talked about it, we'll touch upon it. I remember I, and you can go to my channel, YouTube channel, uh, Lessons Learned. There's an interview with uh, one of the designers of the Shadowrun series of games from Harebrained Games. And they're now making another Kickstarter game called uh, Battletech. Essentially, they're taking all the old tabletop RPG FASA um, properties, Shadowrun, Battletech, and some others, and and making games. Not all their games have been extremely successful, but they've been successful. And one of the final questions I ask them is like, how do you deal with the Kickstarter bloat, right? Because you can, you actually can get a lot of money, and one of the problems is you start, in order to get more money, you start making a lot of promises, right? You're basically hyping the game. Yeah. Which is a problem the entire industry has. And he says, you know, you have to have manageable, realistic goals. And you, ha you don't, you do not, I'm paraphrasing him, um, and I, I blanked out on his name, I apologize. Um, uh, you have to have realistic goals and you have to plan ahead, right? You just simply cannot come up with a goal at the moment. It's like, oh, I got $100,000. Okay, I uh, guess we'll have a, a we'll hand out 100, uh, you know, t-shirt canners or something, you know, because people <laughs> like, people love t-shirts and people love t-shirt canners. So we'll give them that because of course, right? You know, you can't do that. that, that that's not going to work. Uh, but we also had a lot of successes in the in the, uh, in the market and the increasingly double A market. And I think part of it is because a lot of the games do not come burdened with the stuff that people are getting tired in the AAA industry. Like we were talking about microtransactions, right? Yeah. Um, it's like you buy the product and you get the product. Good, bad, or indifferent, right? Um, and they do tend to, if they do it right, they do tend to garner a, a, almost a, a religious love for the for the for the designer and the product. Mm -hmm. Like they become media darlings, they become critic darlings, and they become player darlings. Right? They're like, yes, this is someone who did it right. Like I still go back to playing Stardew Valley, and that's a game that has a, has had a lot of upgrades uh, over the years. Well, two years now, I think the game is out, and I haven't had to pay a single cent for it. Right? Nobody said, oh, by the way, you want mushroom in your game? Uh, that's 50 cents, right? Or you want this, you know, this new hat for your character? That's a buck 20, right? A buck 25. And that game's still successful. And I think he's making the upgrades because people keep buying the game, right? Yeah. It's been ported over to the Switch and mm -hmm. the PlayStation 4. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's a PC game. And people, and now there's a, uh, their upcoming multiplayer module. Oh. Uh, yeah, which is what we're going to be seeing. So basically, but what's going to happen, you're going to have your own character and two other characters can join you, like like, like farmhands, mm. and kind of work together like that. Uh, but in a AAA space, that would not happen, as we saw with Andromeda, unless, you know, you're selling millions of copies and, you know, just, you know, having tons of microtransactions and DLC and the like, right? If it doesn't yeah, hit yeah. that that magical number, whatever that magical number is, it doesn't happen, right? Yeah, that, I believe that uh, uh, Andromeda had like a a lingering plot thread of a of a fourth arc that's not not going to get resolved except through a comic book now because mm -hmm. the game's been shut down. 
Yeah, and it's it's a shame, right? Um, and I mean, I'm thinking, uh, you know, Horizon Zero Dawn. There another go. that's another game that it was it it looks like and plays like a a triple A AAA game. It's an open world game, which is usually left for the triple A industry. Apologies. Um, and it looks gorgeous. It looks great. I would play it because I might seen it. I seen the whole game on Let's Plays. Uh, that's how I know about the game. But it hasn't arrived on PC yet, and I so desperately wanted to play in that in that game on PC. I was gonna say, but is Horizon? A, I thought that was like a triple A game though. Guerrilla Games. No, Guerrilla Games is a developer there. I think a Norwegian developer or Danish oh, developer. Yeah, yeah and, you're right. No, Netherlands. I mean, yeah, Netherlands. I apologize. Um, Neither Denmark or Nor- Norway be. Um, and yeah, it's a $60 game. So it's a price tag is a triple A, but it didn't get developed by what we call a triple A, you know. Sony. <laughs> no. I thought I thought Sony developed that. I guess I was no, wrong. No. It's, a, it's a PS4 exclusive. So it came out for the PS4. Uh, but, um, but it isn't, you know. It, it wasn't developed by Sony, it wasn't. It wasn't a first-party uh, title. It was exclusive enough first-party title. On the other hand, you have Final Fantasy XV, <laughs> which oh. was, what, eight years, nine years development? <sighs> and, I think it was longer than that. And, I mean, a lot of people like the game. I'm still baffled by exactly what, what it is. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck it is i mean it's an open world game but it's also a linear story and i mean true it has a lot of truisms from the final fantasy series of course um it has great characters but they're still pumping out like dlc like oh by the way yeah. this, this piece of story that should have been in the game three years ago now you get to play now it's like yeah and then they're also they're also making spin-offs because they got to milk this like what was it decade long development cycle because you got the fishing game and then you got the rv or the vr game <laughs> and then there's like a, yeah there's it, all these like little mini spin-off games yeah it, I, it's, I mean but, <laughs> good for them that it was successful but in any other environment i think it shouldn't have been successful no <laughs> i'm just my that's my opinion that's just it's laying out there it's just like i i seen it i i'm like I, I, what is this? I mean, it's it has a lot of, I mean, it has a lot of cool ideas and concepts and 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 all. But when you mush it all together, it's mm, you know. There's also the problem. I mean, we talk about, for example, what happens with especially with the double A industry. Obsidian is another example of this. For the longest of time, what Obsidian would do is basically play pickup. They would do the the follow ups of to existing games they did the follow usually for bioware and then for um bedesta they made two follow-ups for for bioware games which was an ever winter nights 2 and kotor 2 and then they made a follow up for uh fallout 3. again in my personal experience none of those games are better than the original although a lot of people don't don't agree with that but one of the things they would do is two things. First of all, they would do it for a limited budget. I don't know, a million dollars, right? And when the money ran out, then they had to rush the market. And second, and this is something that even happened to Bioware and some other double uh, egg developers, they had to navigate a web of publishing deals and copyrights and the like. Because Bioware, when it started, when it really took off, was doing work on someone else's franchises. Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons and and Star Wars. They made their own some new games. The first the first game they made was a mech, a mech game and of course they made Jade Empire. Uh but uh, anything that was Dungeons and Dragons they had to deal with Atari as a publisher. Mm-hmm. I mean, or the people who actually own the rights to Atari. That was one set of people. They had to deal first with Wizard of the Coast and then for no, well, TSR which were the owners of the uh, the rights to Dungeons and Dragons, and then Wizards of the Coast. When it came to Star Wars, they had to deal with Lucas Arts, 
and Wizards of the Coast, because Wizards of the Coast were the ones who developed the tabletop rule set that is used in Knights of the Old Republic. So even Baldur's Gate, I think it was, at, uh, first it was inf uh, Infocom? Yeah, the, the people who, who made uh, Fallout in Black Isle, and then later on it was Atari. So it's this web of publishers and rights and, the, and with the developer, with the developer being always caught in the middle. Uh, look at Mass Effect. Even Mass Effect was published under... Um, um, Microsoft Studios. Microsoft, Microsoft Games, Microsoft Studios, which when Bioware got bought out by EA, it meant that EA didn't have the rights to the original game because Bioware didn't have the rights to that game. They had the right, well, they had the rights, the, the creative rights, but not the distribution rights. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things also there's problems with uh, being an indie, well, not so much an indie developer, because you see indie developers are too small to be caught in this web. But the AA uh, developers not only don't, can probably get the money to make a game, but necessarily have the money to self-publish. Yeah, because the games are that expensive and they need, you know eyeballs, and that also means they have to navigate this sort of legal maze. Same thing happened with Kingdoms of Amalur. The studio went broke. They made a game. The game wasn't successful. Uh, they they the Kurt Chilling took money from the state of Delaware, and they took money from EA to make the game. And so he now all plus he took his own money. So he owes he's he lost a lot of money himself. He still owes money to EA. He still owes money to the state of Delaware. It's another mess. That's why we haven't seen another Kingdoms of Amalur game. That and it wasn't that successful to begin with. It's a great game. It's faulty, but it's a good game. And again, we haven't seen that, right? Um, and and finally, I think one of the problems with AA industry and indies are that they are always looking over their shoulders. Oh, yeah. If, if, if something doesn't work out, if something fails they're done for mm -hmm. one of a one particular game that i played was like an, an adult adult like dating sim thing or visual novel the, the the this particular studio this was their first game in years that they put out their last couple of of the titles i i would probably say they were very successful at least they were well received this one they were going to try for an, for an episodic uh, structure First episode I put up afterwards, they're like, "Nope, didn't meet our numbers. We're shutting down. It's we're we're in debt and we can't afford to put out a second episode or continue going. So that's the end for us." Mm -hmm. And also, they're also looking at each other because when they are successful, they're always mm. a sign, you know, that they can be bought out by a big company like Activision or or EA, or oh, Ubisoft, or anyone else. Like, again, going back to Origin, going back to Bullfrog, um, or BioWare. I was going to say, what, what's that new studio that they bought, the uh, the people who made Titanfall, that just got bought out? Uh, no, they closed Visceral. It used to yeah, be they a, closed Visceral, but the, the uh, people who who made Titanfall... Yeah, Titanfall, they, let me check. Uh, yeah, um, they just recently got bought out by EA. Yeah. Which were people who also left Activision of all places. Uh, Respawn Entertainment. There you go. Yeah. So Respawn was from the people who were making uh, Call of Duty Call games. Of Duty <laughs> games. Independent of Activision, Activision buys the company, buys the, the, the rights to Call of Duty. They had problems with them, so they left. Some people say, some people left. And now they are um, May Respawn Entertainment, which made Titanfall for Microsoft and Electronic Arts. The first game did very well. The second game didn't do so well. So now EA, for whatever reason, I think just to lock up the, the IP, but uh, Respawn. Bungie was another example. They made Halo. They made Halo under the guise of Microsoft Games, an exclusive for Xbox. Halo, Halo 2, Halo 3. I mean, they made a lot of Halos, but eventually said, we're all out of Halos. 
So <laughs> what happened? Well, Microsoft came. Well, we have the right to distribute Halo, and we, this is a, a system seller for us. So you're free to go, but we're keeping Halo. And they kept half of the people from Bungie to do to become three four three studios, and they made Halo four and now Halo five, which haven't done as well as the original Halos because it seems also the audience is getting tired of Halo as well. And now Bungie, well, I don't know how to put this, but Bungie is tied to Activision. Yeah. How much control Activision has over Bungie is unknown, but we do know how much control they have over Destiny. Yeah, they there's some sort of contract that they have to had, like, at least work on it for 10 years. Yeah, so even... If Destiny is Destiny is a AAA game because it's published and recently paid for by a AAA company, Activision. But the company that makes the developers really well could easily have fallen under the the, the rubric of a double A game, right? Um, so those are the dangers too. And there's a, I mean, and I think there's also such a thing as like these uh, double A publishers as well. And like one one that comes to mind is Focus uh, Interactive, mm-hmm. Focus Home Interactive. They've always seemed to to be the publishers of a lot of these mid tier games that I follow. And unfortunately, I've noticed this trend. I, I noticed it last year when they released uh, the second game of Sticks, the little stealth goblin game. Mm-hmm. Um, I noticed with that particular game had a pre order like bonuses if you pre-order the game you get this dlc um i noticed that uh, i noticed that a few of the other games that they're releasing have pre-order bonuses as well so i'm like oh no they're they're starting to kind of fall into that triple a mentality of oh pre-order how do we get those pre-orders let's put some pre-order bonuses and i know it's not the maker or the developers of the game because i've noticed that a lot of it's just seems to be the common thread of just them mm-hmm. because they're, they're i've noticed it for uh games that they're publishing but they're different way different <laughs> developers mm. so so they're becoming more publishers than developers yeah well i don't know if uh, if home fo- focus home interact has ever pu- like developed a game i've only noticed that they tend to publish a lot of them mm. Well, that's another thing. It's uh, it might not seem like a, a, a threat, but we we talked about this before. But you can become too successful in double yeah. business, right? Like involve uh, Activision, uh, you become so big that you, by the very nature, become a triple A studio. Yeah, yeah they become they're a publisher. A pu- right? Yeah, they're just strictly a publisher. A yeah. French, they're a French independent game publisher. At least that's what their wiki says. Yeah, uh, but yeah, they're they're starting to fall into the triple A pre-order culture, so that's kind of concerning. Yeah, I think that's the thing that you can end up. It seems ironic, but become too successful, right? And when you become too big, then the risk is that you are going to. Just do like everyone else, right? Act in the same way as a triple A business, right? In many ways, I think, well, they might not be a double A industry, right? It's a title for these mid range games and the people who make them, but as of yet, there isn't really an industry distinct from it. We can say indies, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons why, and I think one of the reasons why indies in, in, in these years have become so successful is because there's been a, a confluence of nostalgia as well as um, reviving all methods of making games. Yeah. Right. Because you talk about Undertale, for example, you talk about Stardew Valley, uh, a lot of them use sort of this 8-bit, maybe 16-bit Pre, it's between. They don't go so far back as say, a Midhog. I think it was the first game that kind of brushed sides with that as being very basic. 
uh, you know, go back all the way to see Atari 2600 style gra graphics. Nobody wants to go back to that. <laughs> no. Uh, as successful as those games were, looking back at it, they're all ugly. I mean, they're just they're two bit, literally two bit games. Nobody wants to go that back, far back. But we are, as a consumer public, gra you know, graphically speaking, comfortable with say graphics from the NES, the Super NES, the Sir Sega systems. In the home computing market, it would be like your Atari STs and your Amiga, you know, Commodore Amigas, that sort of thing. When games became truly more colorful, but didn't go full on 3D. We haven't seen a lot of games that are retro, say, I don't know, Virtua Fighter. We yeah, or Nintendo 64. Yeah, or the first uh, Star Fox, something like that. Because, as again, as fun as those games were, when they fall on 3D, they they got ugly. They, they were really, they got real ugly. You, know, you sacrifice, you know, beauty, I suppose, for, you know, the feel of being a 3D space. Yeah, I, I think the only way that would work is if it's trying to imitate being clunky, if the the entire clunkiness and aesthetic are, are some sort of plot point to the game I or integral to it. But even then you, you'd have to really make fun, really fun gameplay to complement it. I think it would probably work on a horror game. Maybe. Yeah. I mean that, I think if, if anybody goes there and goes like deliberately goes there, I would say, okay, go horror. Right, because seeing these sort of oblong shapes and these triangles and the faces splatter and all that, um, you know, sort of imitating a nightmare scenario, that could work. But most of the time, you know, people expect a little more polish, right? We're not seeing even, I don't think we're ever really see Xbox, original Xbox, even PlayStation 2, right? No. It, it, so because we have a generation now growing older and they remember playing the NES and the Super NES and those games and the equivalent home computers, uh, they accept the, that kind of gameplay and making those games is much easier, right? Those are test, tried and tested video game design models. They don't require a lot of voice acting, which tends to, you know, put a lot of, uh, you know, raise surprise because you have to hire voice actors. They don't require orchestras for music. Gameplay-wise, time-wise... They can be a couple of hours, right? You know, they don't have to be 40, 60, 100 hours worth of game, right? You can play it in five, you can play in 10, you can play in 15, 20 hours at most, and you're fine, right? That is something that either an individual or a small team can handle under reduced cost. Wherein, one of the things I think that makes the double industry, when people talk about double industry, if it's such a thing exists, is that they're making quote unquote triple A games, games with a triple A polish, but not with all the bloat that comes with it. I yeah. think that probably it's not even about price. It's really that's the closest definition we can get to it, if there's any definition to be had. Uh, but even then, I I'm not really sure that for the moment we can really pin it down. Yeah, like you brought up a triple A polish. I think a Hellblade sing out of sacrifice is mm -hmm. a more recent example of that. Yeah, but again, it was a very short game. One yeah. character. Probably they spend most of their budget just animating that one character. The you know in in Last of Us you had dozens of characters which had you know in a, in a movie studio with you know motion capture and getting their faces and all that. That's very expensive, right? If you can get away with not hiring those actors and the voice acting and the, and the motion, you know, or limit, you know, the amount of um, motion capture you want to do and stuff like that, right? Um, or use older techniques like rotoscoping. Oh, and that'd be, that'd games be interesting. That, I mean, I've seen games in the past who used it. You know, I think there were a couple of Amiga games that relied on it uh, as a way to create that sort of fluid motion of characters that otherwise you couldn't or or some of those t don bluth games too yeah actually there was one that was um well no don bluth uh, you talk about uh dot slayer yeah and uh ace uh 
the space Ace Ace. space game i yeah. i know i think he used some rotor scoping for some of the like mm. movements with like vehicles and stuff yeah because that's classical like disney style you know animation tricks but those games actually were kind of expensive because yeah. the animation <laughs> was high grade and they were on laser disc and laser Which disc very expensive at the time. <laughs> well, the thing about LaserDisc is it never, it never went down in price, right? Because mm-hmm. it was always, uh, unlike CDs and DVDs and Blu-rays and all that, it never caught on. It was, in order to get the maximum uh, effect for your LaserDisc, you had to buy an old, I mean, huge projection televisions which were a screen, and then you had this separate box that had these three lamps that would project to the screen, kind of like a miniature uh, theater. So that TV, those TVs cost, and never actually, again, because of the complex setup, they never went down in price. So easily you could spend five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 on those TVs, which meant when you yeah. bought the laser disc, that also cost you two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000, and each laser disc would cost you around $100 each. Oof. <laughs> and literally, it, it was VA big, like a record player, right, LP, and you had to physically flip it to get the second part of the movie. <laughs> you Because what, what happens, and that's why the CD is called a CD, a compact disc, because they were able to compress all that information into a tiny disc, at least a lot of the audio anyway. Uh, and for a more cheaper price, for a very cheap price, you know, for cents on the dollar compared to a laser disc. Um, and that's a, a thing. Those those games, when they came out, they were like, "Oh, this is the best thing ever," and they didn't make it. I remember I well, I remember the Battle uh, Tech pods that would come out, and those were too also very expensive, right? So, I think the biggest hurdle is always when we talk about double A games. The reality of the the actual cost of making video games is a reality for them. It is a real challenge. And to, on top of trying to get the game sold exactly. as well, and yeah, try and get a hype. In that case, I think uh, their best friends are going to be word of mouth mm-hmm. YouTubers, Twitch, Twitch, yeah, etc. Uh, the classics way you made money, and 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 the thing is. In that sense, from a double A perspective, from a purely developer perspective, yes, the it's not that the the the, the cost of making video games is ever increasing, like it's it's out of control. It's just that it's gotten to the point or they stabilized that it's slightly beyond their reach, right? Now we're talking about twenty five million, fifty million dollars, a hundred million dollars, and even for games that like crowdfunding is successful, they can go a little bit crazy, right? Because in many ways, they already have the money. You know, crowdfunding has a problem that you already have the money here. In a way, you already yeah. made the profit before giving a product. Same thing with early access. And in the classical sense is you have you have to get the money to make the game, but you haven't made any profit yet. So maybe you're going to, you know, make the game with a, you know the classical way which could sell or not and of course you don't have microtransactions or anything else to fall upon up on, uh, fall upon of course to you know make up the shortfall but be- partly because the attraction attractiveness of these games is that they don't have the microtransactions and the end of dlc and the pre-orders and all this stuff yeah and that's kind of something i've been thinking about too is if uh if studios get kind of trapped into the kickstarter kind of cycle like i think of um more recently divinity 2 or, mm. or divinity original scene 2 that game was kickstarted but their previous game it, and its um first one the original sin 1 mm. was also kickstarted so i'm wondering like from what i remember like original sin was very successful so like well did you need to have a why did you need to kickstart the second game if if the first one was a was a uh, successful so i'm kind of thinking is it because the people that are giving you the money ahead of time to make this this game are they the only ones that, are, that would have bought this game if you didn't need a kickstarter and thus you you kind of get your profit up front first 
in a way, Kickstarter can be like pre-ordering. Yeah. Yeah. Where uh, it, it, it helps not only getting the money, of course, uh, because, of course, between games, you're not you don't have a game, which means you still have to keep the lights on and you have to pay people and you know, keep the offices going. Right. So the money you're making one game is supposed to be invested in the next one, of course. And but also tells you how much interest there is. Because if a lot of people don't, if you say, oh, we have, well, this game was successful, we're going to make another one, we're going to kickstart this one as well. I mean, Hairbrains do just the same thing. They always kickstart their products. And a lot of people say, no, we're not interested. Then why take the money and make a, a game if clearly there's no interest? Yeah, I could see that too. And it also because you need to pay for advertising and all that and try to get it to, you know, Let's Players and all, and that also costs money as well. And do the interviews and the cutscenes and chop it around and expos. Kickstarter might also provide not the entire cost. I mean, that's one of the things I think people should be very careful. Kickstarter is there to give you the seed money to make the game. It's not supposed to be the way you make money. Like I was mm -hmm. talking to a friend of mine, a family member was like, oh, they kickstarted. It's like, yeah, dude, but Kickstarter is the investment process. It's not supposed to be the profit process. It's yeah. selling the game that gets you the profit, which then you reinvest and you make the other games, et cetera, et cetera. So I think yeah. Kickstarter serves as a seed money, right? They never they actually ask for the full price because you never know what the full price is going to be. Um, and also it serves as a cushion, right? It gives you that, that, that cushion that allows you to take risk that otherwise wouldn't do that because... And we're coming up close to the end of the hour. I think the one thing that AA and Indies do have over AAA industry is that for all the risk and all the problems that they have, they're more willing to take risk than the AAA industry, who's, lo who's always looking for a sure thing. Yeah, like uh, I, don't, I don't think Undertale would ever get published the way it is by any studio like just the message it sends, just how risky it is with its programming mm -hmm. and some of the quirks it has in its game. Like, there, there's no way. And as critical as I am of, you know, visual novels and stuff like that, and, and I've had those for their, their, their quote unquote not games in my category, the fact that people are making them. Oh, yeah. The fact that people are experimenting with that, with story and all that is always important. And people are buying them. Like, and they're buying them, right? Yeah, it, itchio.io. Like, that's a lot of games that are on there. These quirky little um, indie games in there. And actually, in fact, I've noticed that I think I browsed through a couple of weeks ago. And then I noticed this one that I saw that like, oh, that looks interesting. I noticed that now it's on on um, on PlayStation 4. And mm -hmm. it's like, oh, so that must have been a pretty good worthwhile indie game that if, if it managed to work its way to PlayStation 4. Yeah, and I think they also provide the they provide a padding overall to the to the industry because as another pattern is happening in AAA, it's like all of the cost of making games has gone has stabilized. Hasn't gone down, hasn't gone up necessarily stabilized. The AAA business are making less and less games. Which means their risk are going more are going up more because they have to survive on those games they're making, which means again the games are gonna be, um, you know, very much you know your triple you know, triple FPSs, your open world games, your MMOs, your MMO lights, whatever happens to be the your MOBAs, whatever happens to be the the genre of, of choice that they think it's gonna be the the, the winning formula. Double A and indies not only give you innovation. They also, in many ways, are like indie movies. They make, they still make a profit. When those that make a profit make enough of a profit to keep the overall industry afloat and spread yeah. and spread the risk. It's much easier to have an independent studio or an independent developer fail, have dozens of them, hundreds of them fail, than having a big studio fail. Right? Yeah. And the entire industry sort of, we get your divinities and you get your Call of Duties, right? You get, you get, you know, a lot of coverage around and, and that means that the industry remains healthy. It's when you concentrate on one or the other, then you have real problems. Exactly. Well, we come to the bottom of the hour, the top of the next hour at 10 o'clock.
and that has been our show for uh, tonight. Chat, if you have any ideas for our end of the year show, which is coming up, we're going to be discussing the games that we played, the big news of the year. We're going to bring out the last broken bone of Bioware out and beat it to <laughs> dust because that's what we do here. And uh, more, you're more than welcome. You can drop in here in chat. Uh, Chabamon, can you tell us where we can find you on the interwebs? You can find me on YouTube under Chapelmon. You can find me at uh, Twitter under uh, at Chapelmon underscore Aragon. And I'm mostly Chapelmon everywhere else. And you can find me and this podcast on their YouTube on Lessons Learned and on Twitch on Lessons Learned 1. And you can find me on Tumblr and on Twitter under Rafa Writer. Uh, I'm also working on a new program. I already have two shows at an end, which is uh, ex ex Hacking the Fifth, which is a uh, expanding upon and hacking the fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons rules, and also creating a mega adventure called the Unnameable Terror for the Greyhawk campaign setting, for people who know about that setting from third edition. And also just talking about uh, tabletop games, you know, for an hour or so. And, of course, my regular shows with uh, currently back on my old horse, uh, Kingdoms of Amalur. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Jack and Pomon, for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and it's not too early because we're officially in December. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas to you all. And have a good night. Good night, everybody.